right, so my name is Jason, and uh, this is JJ. I'm with Universal Laser Systems. He's with ISD. Uh, if you have any problems, this man is the guy. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many here uh, have operated a Universal Laser System? You know, at least one. And at least one it is. Okay. Um, so first, you're going to go to him. And after that, then go to JJ. Alright, um, so right now, the first thing I want to start off with is software training. Um, and it's basically just our driver. Um, the computer, we have it set up and everything. You probably have some sort of graphics program in there. Um, if you're familiar with RhinoCAD or AutoCAD or Illustrator, whatever software you have, um, the only thing you'll need is to have it set up correctly. But when you guys get the computer, on the JJ will come out and make sure that everything is going to be running seamlessly uh, from that point on. Um, but I at least want to go over some of the base stuff here. So there's probably, if you're not going to be using this machine in the next two weeks, most likely that's why this video camera is here, so you're going to get the majority of it. Um, so that being said, well, I'm just trying to step up. Yeah, I was going to say, you guys might want to kind of come in. Uh, I don't know if you want to get an angle on the, on the camera so we can at least have everybody mm -hmm. filling in and then um, and then if some people want to come back in this area here uh, just so we can get a good view of, of the software. Um, can everybody see this? Okay. Um, so this is this is the UCP. Um, this is the, the driver software for this uh, for this system. Um, it's sending a job to it is like sending it to a regular like Epson printer or, or HP printer type thing. It's just that certain portions of the graphic software have to be set up so that it reads certain colors and knows what it's going to do for its uh, uh, the, the actual motion of the system. Uh, we'll go into that a little bit later. Um, I just kind of want to start off with that. Uh, with the UCP, there's a viewer tab, a systems tab, and a diagnostics tab. Uh, if you're having issues with the system and call somebody, we're going to take over the diagnostics tab. If something is out of calibration, or say it's uh, you want it to do a certain function before it actually goes into motion, uh, you'd be using the systems tab. Again, I'll go back over in detail uh, on this. Uh, the viewer tab is going to be your main uh, main portion of the driver that you're going to use to, to use this machine and function the machine correctly. Um, uh, right now we only have a job in here, but as you go through, if there's certain jobs that you want to want to keep, um, say it's a project that you do once a semester and you really just want to send it once, uh, you can lock it in as permanent. Um, and the, the laundry list that you, you could uh, comprise is up to 2,000, uh, which is also adjusted here in the upper right hand corner um, uh, down to say you, you're only going to want 150 files in there or something. So as soon as it gets to the 150 file, it's actually going to replace, I believe, the last file that is loaded. Well, maybe it could be the first file. Uh, I've never really had to deal with that. It's, you have to go through 2,000 files. Um, anyways, uh, it, it will tell you the number, uh, one of whatever. Uh, you could access the whole list here. So if we had more jobs in, this would be a full laundry list. Uh, we could also toggle through each job. And then there's this yellow folder. Uh, with this yellow folder, uh, you'll have a laundry list of jobs, uh, which it will also show the, uh, the, the image. Uh, the images aren't that, that clear, so they may look a little bit rougher than the graphic software that you're actually using. Um, there's, there's a permanent button here, so if you wanted to keep it permanent, you basically would select that on whatever job you wanted to. Um, and the text, which you can't see because it's you only have one highlighted, but basically, um, if it's not permanent, it will be a color blue. Uh, the text will be blue. If it is permanent, it will be black. So I don't, if you're looking at the list and you see some blue and some black, the black ones are permanent, uh, the blue ones are not. 
Uh, you can delete jobs individually. Uh, if it's permanent, it's going to say you can't because it's more permanent. And then there's a purge button here. So end of the semester, end of the week, end of the night, however which way you want to do it. If you're going to say you want uh, just a, a basic screen on there because if you're in this main screen here and there's no jobs in there, this will actually be solid gray, kind of like this background color here. So if you wanted to keep the first file in there just permanent so that way you can purge the whole system uh, and just keep that one so you actually have uh, a one page in there. Because if this is grayed out, you cannot actually function like moving the laser, the, the, the carriage into a position without having a print job in there. So again, there's a purge button. Anything that's colored blue, it'll just dump all of that and it condense all the black uh, permanent files together. Um, you do have direct import, which this is the feature you would use for direct import. But um, when you guys get the computer set up, um, uh, JJ will go through it and make sure that, uh, that you guys understand that feature. Uh, up at the top of the top bar of the screen, you have uh, the, basically the, the control panel. Uh, it's going to tell you what system it is. In this case, it's an ILS 12, and then the version of the software. If you have any issues with this software, it's go, we're going to ask you, or JJ is going to ask you, what's your driver number uh, or, or version. That's going to be your driver version right there. Uh, when, you, when you output, when you output the, the file, that's basically what this next line is, is it's saying you've output it for an ILS-12 uh, with a 75 watt laser. Uh, you see a big green button here. Uh, that green button is a play button. You hit the play button, it then goes into motion. When it is in motion, uh, this, this pause button will be highlighted, and all you have to do is click that and it will pause. There's also a pause button here on the, on the keypad. Um, if you were mid-job, you wanted to pause it because there's no one else around and it's late at night and you are cutting wood, you may think, you know what, I'm just going to go run, run upstairs because I'm sure you know it's, it's that close, um, that I'm only going to be gone for a minute. Well, guess what? Wood is very flammable. So what's going to happen is, is even though you're running air, uh, uh, air through the cone and it's extinguishing a small bit of flame, or you're cutting acrylic, which is even more volatile, is you're going to leave this room as it's running, and then all of a sudden something's going to catch on fire. Um, you don't know, but as you're walking upstairs, you're taking the lift. Uh, now you have this 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 barbecue in the middle of, of this uh, beautiful establishment, and. <clears throat> But the good thing is, is there is a thermal sensor here. Uh, provided that the flame is close to that thermal sensor, if it's up close here, it's not going to notice. The machine's going to continue to run, and you're going to cause major damage to the system. So, that being said, it is highly, highly recommended and completely frowned upon to water. It's recommended to pause the machine, frowned upon to let it run while you leave the room. So, unless if you have somebody monitoring the system, just click the pause button. Go do what you need to do, answer the phone, use the bathroom, whatever, come back, just hit the pause button again because you'll, it'll have basically one dash for a pause and a play button for a resume. So it will start off where it left off. Uh, if uh, you need to focus, uh, to focus the machine, you can either use the keypad, and we'll go over the functions with this, but Z, um, you, have, you have four or three motions. X, left to right, Y, front to back, and Z for your vertical. Uh, you can operate those with the, with the software. So up, down, go over to the left. Moving in a very slow motion. But left, up, back, all four directions. Um, if for some reason uh, you have something in the system and the arm bumps, or you, you, the, it, the arm gets jostled or moved out of position, 
These are stepper motors. They are not uh, servo motors. Servo motors run with uh, decoder sh or uh, uh, coated strips, and they know where they're at. So if they slip out of position, they go, well, I'm over here now. Stepper motors are dumb. They have no idea where they're at. So if this carriage of the arm, the gantry system gets moved out of position because you bumped into it, or it moved into a piece of material because the, the table wasn't focused correctly, um, it now thinks it's over here, even though it's over here. When that happens, you click home X, Y, and it will go back to that back right corner and return home. So now it knows I'm back in that zero position and it, it will go wherever you need the artwork. Uh, where you need the artwork. Uh, home Z happens every once in a while. Uh, we'll go over the cutting table in a second, but if the table comes out of calibration, meaning you use the focus tool, you'll know you're within focus, but it's saying it's at three inches below the, below the, the material. Uh, you'll talk to JJ, uh, I'm sorry, Robert, Robert, yeah. or, or Robert, and he'll say, well, you just need to recalibrate it. In order to recalibrate it, you have to hit home Z, that will drop the table all the way down to the bottom, and then you just need to bring it back up, double check your calibration. If it's good, you're fine. Um, if it's out, using the focus tool, then you just need to, to calibrate that, and we'll go over that in, in a few minutes. Um, zooming. So we have a little, a little icon that looks like a, a magnifying glass. Left click uh, goes in, right click comes out. If you have uh, a little scroll uh, feature on your mouse, it will also go in and out. Focus view. Uh, focus view will allow you to move the, uh, move the carriage where you want. So you'll notice there's a crosshair. Well, my artwork is here in the center, so what I want to do is zoom into it. And then I'm going to focus, go to focus view, and I'm just going to get a rough idea of where I want it to be, and it will move that accordingly. So if you're dealing with something that's dome-shaped or odd-shaped, um, I would be surprised if you guys didn't have that yet. Um, <clears throat> is, <pretty> on. <laughs> is you want to focus in on a certain point. So you have two, two ways of doing it. If you know the, the exact point, which uh, right here on your X, Y, you'll actually see that change as, uh, you know, if you get close in there, I think this is actually set to dead center. Uh, it's actually not. Uh, but if it was dead center or you had a certain location, uh, eight inch by nine inches or something along the, the, the area, um, you could either get it in close or come down to this go button and actually type in each figure, hit go to, and it will then move the carriage to that exact location. Um, when, you are, when you're out and just using focus view and you're using the positioning portion of it, it's fairly accurate. Uh, it's within about it's within about ten thousandths, but if you are looking for precision, then that's when you want to input the figures for it to actually be where you want. Um, say say you you actually you find that the position of your piece is right here, but your artwork is here. Um, instead of moving your piece into position, what you can do is actually go over to the uh, uh, relocation, either type in the figure or you'll notice that there's these boxes right here. You could actually go to one of these boxes, we'll just hit the center one, um, and then go to pointer. And it will then move the artwork to the center point of where the carriage is located. Um, and that will be whatever point you highlight. So say, oh, I meant to hit this guy here. You go, oh, well, you know what, I kind of made a mistake. I realized my, my um, my piece is in the wrong place. If you want to back up, you can hit undo, and it will go back just like a standard computer uh, command. Um, you can also position your artwork if you know where you kind of want it. So say if you want it dead center, then you can actually put in those coordinates. If you want an offset to a different location, you can put those coordinates in there, and it will move the artwork to that location. Now, this works when the artwork is smaller than the table size. So if your artwork is uh, 48 by 24, that whole relocation of artwork stuff, not gonna work for you. <coughs> so 
we have we have a, a multiple tool for our feature. Uh, basically, uh, this works great when you're dealing with uh, something where your artwork, you have one piece, but you need to do 25 of them. Um, it defaults to, a, to a, a, a tenth of an inch. You could go ahead and adjust that. Uh, I've, I've actually found that if your, your pieces are odd shaped, and say that it's kind of like a, a trapezoid or sword, so the right side is like this angle, the left side is this angle, so when you duplicate it, obviously if it's a tenth of an inch off, you're gonna be a tenth of an inch off from this point to this point. But if you hit it to zero, it'll actually bring it like this, so as long as the artwork isn't intersecting, you could actually bring it to zero and that will bring it in close. If you wanted to tile it in closer than that, unfortunately you'll have to copy and paste through your art program, your graphics program, and then tile it that way. Um, so there's a couple ways of doing this. So if I go ahead and grab my artwork and I'm going to move it to the upper left hand corner, make sure that I'm actually zoomed out all the way. Upper left hand corner, that's about what I want it. Now, I basically just want to see how many pieces I could fit on this page. If I hit, go into the multiples, if I if my gap is good, I'm going to hit the plus sign. What that will do is it will max it out to however much space um, that, that's allotted for it. Um, if, if I go, well, you know what, I don't really need that many. Then all I have to do is hit minus and that'll take it down. Let's say I want to go 10 across and 10 down. Hit apply and that'll, that'll give you what you need. If, uh, so you're just you're giving a visual grid. Correct. Well, you're not, th this is because I have a crosshair there. It would be whatever your image is. So if you had circles, then you'd have tons of circles. Oh, I see. Um, so if, if for some reason, you right away, you need like five pieces, and to, if somebody's you know, on your butt and saying, hey, I need five pieces right now. What you can do is you can wait until it cuts those five pieces, and you can pause it. Give them the five, pull up, pull up the, the, the five pieces out, give it to them, resume, and it should resume where, where it left off. Or you say, you know what, I need to do those five pieces now, and, and after you get done with those five pieces, you go to lunch, you power down the machine, and you come back, you go, well, you know what, I have all that stuff cut out. I don't want to wait for those five slots to be filled because I don't have that material in. You can come in here and actually shut whatever you want off. So in this case, I shut those five off and now it will proceed on number six and where it left off. Uh, and you can basically just come by and shut whatever you want off and just click it again to turn it back on. Um, I love using this feature when I am testing a material. Uh, sometimes you may get some odd material and the materials database doesn't have that material listed. So you think of something that's close to it pick that material you find well it's cutting too hot it's cutting too too light and or you're, you're trying to fine-tune that setting instead of repositioning one piece of artwork over and over and over or moving you know rotating a piece of material through to find that sweet spot I mean because if you're doing something that's an odd shape on this square so say you go well I'm just gonna rotate it this way this way. You're just going to end up using this material, but you're really not going to be able to fill it correctly. So what I like doing is using the multiple tool, the multiplier, because what I will do is take that image, whatever my material is, I will tile it, my artwork, to this material. So the first thing I'll do, and I'm just going to minimize, uh, minimize these guys here just for examples. So what I will do is I will start off with my, with my first image, run my test. If the, if the test is like not good, I need to make a, an adjustment to the settings, I will actually turn the next one on and shut the next one off. And then adjust my settings, try it again. If 
if it's, uh, if it's still off and I still need tuning, then I go to the next one, so on and so forth, until I reach my ideal setting. And then I'll document that, and then uh, again, we'll go, over, we'll go over how to save those settings um, in, in a brief period. Um, so you're wondering how, how long a job is going to take. Because uh, you're, you're under a deadline, or you have a meeting, you have a class, you have something, and you need to know how long this, this is going to take. So if we go ahead and back out, and I'm going to put this to the full field, we're going, how long will this take? We actually have a little estimator here. You hit start, and it will go through. If you have multiple colors, it will do each color separately. And then right there to do a full page with our settings, 16 minutes 34 seconds um, it's not hundred percent accurate but it's very very close so the worst time difference I've had was about a minute and a half so it's not like you, it's gonna say 15 minutes and it takes a half hour if it says it's gonna take 15 minutes it may take 14 it may take 16 um, oh uh, you could only do this while the system is idle so say you have a project going and you want to see what the next, how long the next project's going to take, you could either pause that job momentarily, run the, the time on, the, on that file, and then go back and resume. Uh, but you can't, uh, you can't just run that clock while it's in running, while it's running a, a different job, or even running the job that, that you were running at the time. Any questions? <laughs> okay, so we're going to go ahead and go to our settings button. Uh, right now we just have a job that we use the materials database. Um, so when you use the, when you output through your graphics software, uh, you have this materials database at your disposal. So for every, everybody who has not used this system, it's not like we have these magical numbers you need to come up with or we keep hidden away in a locker someplace away from you. Um, uh, we have fabrics, ceramics, foam, glass. Now there may be a cut setting that it, that it provides. There, there may be a, a, a scoring setting and an engraving setting. Not all materials engrave, not all materials score, not all materials cut. Depends on the actual material itself. Um, it will still do the job of vectoring or rastering. Uh, does anybody know the difference between a vector and raster when it comes to artwork? They're spelled differently. There, there <laughs> is that. So, uh, <laughs> raster, th think of a, a raster image would be like a, a, a poster board or a photo, something like bitmap. that. So, bitmap. So, so a raster would be if, if in your graphic software you type something out and it's solid black or you're etching a black square it would go left to right, etch, and, and vaporize that, that material. That would be rastering. Vectoring will actually follow the path. So in this case, we have crosshairs in there. It's going to go ahead and just follow those crosshairs. Uh, you notice that in this here, we only have three colors. You can actually use up to eight colors in this program. Um, it's just when you output, you either output through the materials database, or you output through manual control. That's what the secondary tab is, is manual control. Um, when, if you're looking for a base setting, what you would do, actually let me, I'm just gonna go here to this publisher. Um, you can use some basic, basic software. Uh, I recommend that you use graphic software. Um, Corel Draw, Illustrator, AutoCAD, RhinoCAD, something that, that has graphic capabilities because you're going to be able to use multi colors, multi layers. Uh, certain uh, software, like this is a, a publisher, uh, you may find that there's limitations when it comes to these. We'll types probably have of Illustrator and uh, Rhino. Okay, we'll yeah. definitely have Rhino, I think we'll probably have Illustrator. So, so that's yeah. great because that. Maybe those those are true graphic, so, graphic programs, and, and that'll, that'll help out. Uh, license. <laughs> so when we go to print. Oh, it's free. All right, that's Where's the, how would I get to the extension? Oh, print properties. Okay, so 
Illustrator. Illustrate. Oh, you know what? I just tell something up there. You guys see that at all? You see the phone, right? Um, what, what, what I did by accident, but it's a good lesson, is that you can't have the materials database open in the, the driver software and then try to open it when you're outputting through your graphics software. Uh, it's a conflict because that page will stay open and uh, you're just going to run into issues. Uh, so coming back to this, printer properties, I think in Illustrator it might be called something different. Print settings. Yeah, print settings, yeah. but you'll have some sort of properties deal where you can come in. Now, when you're when you're talking, excuse me, when you're talking about using different colors, you're talking about in in the other software for the ability for it to read those. Correct. Yeah. So so the the big three when you're when you're dealing with the materials database, the big three that you have is black, blue, and red. Black is raster, blue is vector scoring or vector engraving, as it's uh, noted here, um, and the other one is vector cutting. Red. So so with that being said, if we were to go to so we'll go to natural and paper, because uh, I just mentioned paper earlier. Uh, you select your material. It's going to ask you to put in a material thickness. So it's good to have calipers. Uh, that way you can measure your material thickness or some sort of measuring device. So we can get a little bit more accurate on uh, that thickness. Um, the material thickness is twofold when it comes to our software. Um, if, you, if you're using the auto, um, Autofocus or, or AutoZ, it will actually raise and lower the table provided it's calibrated correctly to that material thickness so you will maintain that focus. Um, when you're cutting materials, focus isn't a, um, it's not a crucial element, but if you're engraving and you're trying to engrave detail, that's when it comes into play because if you're a quarter inch out, that's gonna, you're gonna end up with fuzzy engraving, it's gonna, it's not gonna engrave fully, it's gonna look terrible, and then you're gonna call us up and we're gonna be like, it's just a focus issue, and you're gonna, oh yeah, you told me about that the first day. So, but anyways, the, the second thing it does is with the materials database, that material thickness will actually denote the power settings that we have in our database. So a quarter inch, uh, a quarter inch board will be a different, or a, in this case, wood, quarter inch wood will be at a different power setting than uh, half inch or eighth inch. So putting that material thickness in there will help you identify the proper material setting that we have set in there. Now these are all base settings. Uh, it's, it's a starting point. Uh, the, the, the dynamic of, of a laser system is it comes twofold. Uh, you have the laser cartridge, the laser source, uh, those are both the same thing, and then you have the laser system. Each one of them are basically two different personalities, uh, but together that's when they create, you know, you'll, you'll be able to kind of get a feel for the machine and the proper settings for certain materials that you process. Um, you said you were worked with the ILS-9 before. Yeah. Uh, what was the wattage? 55. 55, okay, so he had, he had a 55 watt smaller unit, gonna be a completely different material setting with using a 75 and having a larger table because of the distance. Uh, and the power of, of that, that laser. Um, so, say, say you come in here, we, we have the, the proper material thickness, we hit apply. That'll lock in the, the material setting. If we come over here to manual control, you'll notice that now we have eight colors. So, if, if, we, were, if we were satisfied, uh, with, say we're running tests and we're using the materials database, we hit apply, we hit OK, go through, boom, everything's fine, awesome, materials database worked out for you, but when you come through uh, to the, so I'm just going to hit cancel, when you come into the, the software, you'll notice that we only have three colors here. Now the reason why it's three colors is because we originally outputted only in the, uh, with the materials database tab. If uh, if we actually output, if we actually output through uh, manual control, I kind of did something here. Typically more 
professional when I use my own computer. <laughs> Okay, I don't know what I did. I think I started some program and then it closed something up here. So if, if we have if we have our materials selected, we have we have everything good, but we want zero zero five to five thousandths. Hit apply and come back over. It's apparently the same thickness. Um, <laughs> that might affect the actual cutting. So hold on one second. Okay, so that actually affected the cutting for that material. So it went from 11% power, or yeah, 11% power to 100% power. So depending on the material, it will adjust either the raster or the vector, depending on what you're trying to do. Most people aren't going to raster paper, so I think that's why it really didn't adjust the thickness. And really, most of the time, uh, the thickness is going to be cutting based anyways because if you're if you're if you're engraving wood that is that is you know this is what like three sixteenths or quarter you know I think this is less than a quarter inch. But if you're if you're engraving wood that is eighth inch versus quarter inch, um, you're really gonna etch the same depth anyways. If you're going to adjust that it's going to depending on the density of the wood, it's still gonna etch relatively the same. But your cutting is going to be different between that eighth inch and quarter inch piece of wood. So that's probably why I actually only did that. Um, I do remember it used to adjust the thickness or the, the power settings of the raster. That could have been an update that I was uh, unaware of, or it could be attributed to the actual material itself. So you know, the material thickness, well, that is 24 by 48. What's the depth? The largest or the thickest piece of so, so this table will go all the way down to 12 inches. Now, when you put the cutting table in, you're now down to about six inches. Um, there is a weight limit to this table as well. So, if you guys are going to be etching something that is very heavy, note, note to self that you'll have to lower that table down, get as close as possible, then put the material in and possibly, hopefully be able to adjust it from there. But typically it's around a 40, 40 pound max on these tables. If you go more than that, you're gonna end up binding, you could possibly burn out the motor, uh, and also uh, pop a circuit board. Uh, so try to keep it, try to keep it under 40 pounds if you're gonna have that material in there while you're adjusting the table. Um, I used to run into some issues with one of my, my machines I, I used to operate, and when it was a little bit heavier, like when I was doing bricks, I would actually just come, under, come underneath the table like, a, like I'm a spotter and just slightly lift up on it. Just that may actually give it enough to help guide that table up. So it just may need a little helping hand, but try not to put too much weight uh, over the, the max. Uh, so if you, you adjust the height, you adjust the height to the right height and then put your material in? Yeah, so I mean, if you get a ruler, you measure out that you're yeah. six inches and it's a heavy stone or something that you're gonna be putting in there, then just Put it to six inches. Come over. Obviously, you're gonna have a couple of people with you. I doubt uh, anyone, and there's not one person here that's gonna be lifting a big stone. Um, but you could bring that in, set it down. Try not to hurt yourself. Check your focus if you need to.
to adjust the focus, then I would pull that stone out and adjust it accordingly, using either calipers or a ruler to figure out that focal height uh, or distance with that focal height. That's pretty much it on outputting. Now, outputting, uh, outputting through the software, it, you'll find that there's a lot of stuff that is unlocked that you're able to use. When you get everything over to the software and you come over to settings, you will find either if you output it through the materials database, you're limited on colors, or if you went through manual control, you at least unlock the colors. Now you can go back over to the database after the fact. And if you make adjustments, it will only adjust those three colors, but you will still have those five other colors to play with. You would just have to manually change those. Um, the direction, that is locked. So anything that is grayed out after it has been sent over to the software, you cannot change it in the software, you have to go and resubmit that that, uh, that artwork through your graphic software in order to change those lockout functions. Um, changing material thickness, that is unlocked. All your adjustments are all unlocked when it comes to material settings. So anything that has red to it, you can definitely uh, adjust. Um, when you're wanting to save a setting, I always recommend that you hit apply and then OK. Uh, sometimes if you don't hit the apply button, uh, what's going to happen is it's not going to keep that settings, uh, the, the settings that you adjusted to. So say you changed it and for some reason you didn't hit apply, hit OK, um, it may not have saved that setting as it went through. Um, as a save as well, on the display, you have a file button, or uh, three different things. You have file, X, Y, and Z. If you go over to file, we have on the fly adjustments when it comes to uh, the, the color and the, the, the speed, power, and PPI. You can't change that on here. They call it on the fly adjustments. It's really not on the fly. Uh, there is a slight hesitation um, so I always recommend that you pause it, make your adjustment, and then resume by hitting the pause button one more time, and that means the settings will then lock in right away. They do reflect onto, uh, the, the, not the database, but the manual control. So if you change the settings here, you run your job, and you, you say that you're going to be using this, um, you're rastering a piece of wood, and you're trying to find that perfect depth, uh, what you can do is, Pause it, adjust it, resume, pause it, adjust it, resume until you find that per perfect depth. And then you can come back over and you'll find that that setting is in, in your uh, manual control on the UCP. Uh, the reason why I say that is if you said that, you come back over and you're like, well, I want to save this setting. Um, it's going to be good. I don't know if you guys carry around a nice little thumb drive with you. Um, uh, there's two forms of saving uh, materials. The, the easiest form that I think uh, is, is you're going to pull in all the attributes of manual control, and if you save it, you're going to save it as an LAS file. So you just put it in a folder, it'll be what it, whatever you entitle it, .las. Um, and all you have to do is go load and bring it back in. So there's a load button so you can bring that setting in. So if you have an eight color job and you have particular settings for that material, you know, say it's a, a, a cast, cast acrylic or, or something, and um, you want to save that, save it cast acrylic. And I always denote the thickness uh, because, you know, obviously if you're cutting something, uh, the, the, the setting's going to change per thickness. Um, the second uh, way of, of saving it's going to be on the, the system itself, but say you're going, you know, you know, you guys no longer have, that was at a different school or company, the, the nine. Mm -hmm. uh, do you still visit that or? Are you, yeah. So, so in that, in that aspect, having the LAS file would be good because say you're going to use that as your own base setting and then adjust that for a different laser system. Um, but say you're solely using this. What you can do is say you started off with um, cast acrylic as your setting. You could actually clone that material 
and then make the adjustments and then go into the hard file of that uh, cloned material and make that adjustment. So say you have a certain class where you're gonna be using five different materials that are very close to five materials that are in the database. You could create a folder for that class, input those five clone materials, name them whatever you want, say they're different thicknesses or what, and in that way your students, you can say, listen, everything is in this folder, so they just need to go to that folder and select that material, and they're not recreating the wheel every time. Uh, the only other thing is on, on there, say you do have, well, do you guys typically have different logins per students? Or is it gonna be one solid we login? We do, I would guess for this we might just have one login. One login, machine. okay. Yeah. So you can even save those LAS files in a certain folder and then have them there as well, just keep them in manual control if they're gonna be using more than three colors. Because again, if you clone a material, it will be in the materials database, but that's only four three colors. So if you're using uh, four plus colors, you wanna save that LAS file to maintain the integrity of those settings. Uh, do you have any questions on that at all? And uh, going into cloning uh, really quick, let's say we're gonna we're gonna clone this copy paper. Uh, all you have to do is right click it. There's clone, and then you'll have all your settings that are unlocked that you can adjust. So you can actually adjust your. Uh, you can put in a base setting, and then you can put minimum thickness and max thickness. And you can do one of two things. You can let the you can let the database control that difference, or you may find that uh, you have eight, eighth inch, quarter inch, and three eighths. It's an eighth inch difference between those uh, those three different thickness materials. You may find that oh well, it's going to use equal increments for each one of those thicknesses to adjust. You may find that quarter inch doesn't cut as well at as a 50% of whatever this was, or however which way it adjusted to compensate for each one of those. You could actually go in and manually adjust the power output just for that one material. So right here, there's enter cut data, and that's where you could. You, you'll basically have your individual material thicknesses and you can manually input those uh, settings. So instead of it being 10%, 25%, and uh, 35% or 50% for those different thicknesses, say that 25% just isn't cutting it, but 30% does, and then even this material here that automatically populated that 50 or that 35%, 50% cuts that better, then you could adjust that accordingly and then save it and it will, it will use that when you input that paper. <laughs> um, there are certain, there's a note box there too as well. So if, if there's something like uh, putting the cone in to use the air assist for a certain material because it, it flames up, uh, uh, really big uh, or a lot, you can put in there and make sure the cone is in, air is on, those types of notes. Uh, or if there's a certain material thickness, say you didn't want to input that little control element of that, that uh, quarter inch, and you, you need to add extra to it. You can always put those notes in, and then when they come in to, when they come into the, the material, uh, there's actually a notes section that should appear uh, right here. So it says notes, colon, and then you'll have whatever notes that you typed in there will appear on that material. Uh, we also have uh, an advanced driver, and what that advanced driver is is, is mainly for your guys' uh, uh, benefits. It helps you out. So what you could do is if you had five materials that you use and you put it up on a board of all the material settings so you kind of, you know, dumbify it. Um, you can actually go into that advanced settings and reduce the, the capabilities of that driver. So that way students can't come in and start screwing with certain things 
it'll lock them out. So it's used for, for educational purposes and also like mall kiosks and stuff where you have a minimum wage employee and you really don't want them messing with your machine. You just want them doing great dog tags all day. So um, there will be stuff like that added to your, your desktop um, that, that you could uh, control if you feel the need to. Um, in this, in the, the, the settings as well, if, uh, if one student screws something up, you just hit defaults and that'll wipe everything clean. It's not going to wipe the, your added materials, um, it's just going to default all the rest of the material thicknesses uh, and that type of thing. Because even though when we went to that little clone uh, deal to clone a material, if I come in here to any material and double click it, all that stuff is grayed out. So a kid or you, you can't go into an original material and adjust it. You have to clone it and then adjust it from there. All, all the stuff that's stock is all, all locked and, and unadjusted. Alright, I believe that is it. Oh, um, Systems tab. Okay, so I have two more tabs to go. All right, uh, Systems tab. We kind of briefly went over the, the the amount of jobs that are loaded into a uh, or that, that's allotted to, to go into a system. Uh, tuning. When you're etching, uh, basically what tuning is is uh, let me actually grab my loop so everybody can see it. Make sure everybody has eagle eyes around here but I use a loop because I can't see that one. Uh, is that okay, so tuning wizard, what this does is it etches a vertical dot pattern. And each one of those numbers represent uh, a, a number value for, uh, for that tuning. Um, what that does is it, it gives you good uh, edge quality or allow you to have good edge quality. Uh, what'll happen is, is it breaks it apart in vertical dots. You're looking for those dots to be in a straight line. If for some reason they're off, then what's gonna happen is when you etch something, it's gonna have a choppy edge to it. That right there will clean up your edge. And what that, what that is for is that, since we, I mentioned earlier, we have stepper motors. Uh, stepper motors, there's a certain amount of slop that's in them. What tuning does is tuning takes that slop out and adjusts for that. Now, a lot of trophy shops and award shops, they typically etch in the top left corner um, because there's a ruler there, they're able to stop um, certain, uh, you know, their material, they can, they can put it in that corner. That's great for positioning, but it's bad for engraving because what's gonna happen is, is over a two year period, they're gonna etch 90% of their work in that top corner. Our belts aren't made of some sort of mir uh, miracle material that doesn't wear. So what will happen is they will wear a spot in that belt and will cause extra slop. So there's the, the teeth will wear out and there's too much play. So you have the machine for a few years, you find that the etching isn't that clear. If you move the etching over, you may find it clears up. So if that's the case, then what it is is you've just worn out that belt in one location. Um, you guys probably would be doing more cutting than engraving with it. Really that slop, it's not going to affect your cutting. It's mainly engraving that, that, where that's going to show up. So if you do have a class in a semester that you say, hey, we have a laser now, we're going to have a raster class. The only thing we're going to do is raster engraving. Move that material around uh, just off that, that back ruler so that way you can maximize the potential of your belt. Um, the, the worst thing is, is you're going to spend, you know, a, whatever the cost, so 25 or 30 bucks on that belt to replace it when you could have placed your pieces of wood or, or your, your artwork around to maximize the potential because you could wear this, this portion of that belt out within a year or if you move that artwork around, you could have that belt for three, four years depending on how much you actually use uh, the, the, the system. Um, if you Typically in, in the more commercial atmosphere, they're gonna be using a machine 36 to 40 hours a week they're going to actually be changing that belt out like once every six months to once every year. If you guys are mainly cutting, you're really not going to have to worry so much about that. Um, and it's going, to be, it's going to be fairly intermittent when it comes to the, 
uh, it comes to the usage of the, of the machine. You're going to have periods where you're not going to be using the machine that much. Um, so say in between semesters, uh, summertime you may not have to worry about it so much, but if you have like a winter break and you shut down all the ventilation in here for, for a month and it gets cold, because I'm sure it snows out here, uh, the laser, the source itself will actually be negatively affected with extreme cold. Uh, the gases and everything in that laser source is based off of uh, a vacuum. So what happens is, is you have two optics that are uh, bolted in on each side. And those seals, when the, when the aluminum is cold, there's small gaps. It's not that the gases escape, it's that atmosphere leaches in, floods the mixture, and you end up with low power. Um, that will deteriorate or cause the laser to, to, to deteriorate at a faster pace or rate than um, having something that's normally used or in a warmer environment. So if you do go for a winter break, take that laser source out and put it in the office someplace that may have a heater going uh, throughout that two weeks or a month. Um, and then all you have to do is put it back in and you should not have any uh, negative effects of taking it out and putting it in unless if you drop it. Uh, if you drop it, then we'll, we'll, we'll handle that when that happens. What about summer? Humidity is really not going to affect it. It's going to be warm. Our, our lasers are comfortable at 70 degrees. That's why we live in Arizona. And throughout the cold season, it's roughly around 70 degrees anyway. And in summertime, we have air conditioning. So, you know. <laughs> in summertime, if it heats up, the, the heat, as long as you're not in operation, the heat isn't going to negatively affect uh, the laser source. It's only the cold that negatively affects it. As well as if you come in and you're going to start off first thing in the morning and it's 50 degrees in here because you're just starting up, um, you're going to want the air to kind of warm up a little bit and get closer to the 70 degree mark. Um, the difference with the, the, the characteristics of the laser, it, it, it's air cooled. So if it's already cold air on the outside and it's not heating up to a certain temperature, you're going to have irregular uh, uh, effects, uh, intermittent effects of the laser. So just like that low percentage of uh, power, you're going to have intermittent uh, issues with that laser. When it gets too hot, so say it's 80, 90 degrees in here, I uh, don't care what the humidity is, but it's hot, and you don't cool down that outer air, it will try to cool it with pulling in some air but if it doesn't get down to that temperature, what's going to happen is if it gets too hot, the laser's just going to shut off. Meaning that everything will turn on, but that laser will shut off and just do a, a cool down until it gets to a comfortable temperature again. So if it is hot in here when you come in, try to run the AC and cool that air and get a little bit cooler to where you can keep that moderate temperature for, for good quality cut or engraving. Um, when it comes to when it comes to uh, you you get uh, an error with a cutting table in it says erroneous fixture height. Uh, what that is is your calibration is off. Uh, what you'll have to do is remove the cutting table, hit the home Z that's in the viewer tab. It will lower the table all the way down. You could bring up the table. Uh, you don't necessarily need to stand here and hold the, the Z button and bring that table up. Uh, what you can actually do is if you go to your focus view, hit the go, there's a Z feature down here. You can input a, a number value, hit go, uh, hit go to, and it will raise that table up. Uh, what I like to do, uh, especially if you have a cutting table in there and say everything's calibrated correctly, just in case it doesn't see that cutting table because somebody didn't put or place the cutting table in correct, um, I always like to put it an inch below the focal, focal height. Um, that being said, with the cutting table in there, it is kind of a double-edged sword. Just note that if you go to Z and the table's all the way down and you have a cutting table in there and it says 12 inches, guess what? It's either not recognizing that cutting table or there's something wrong with the calibration. Do not use that automated control to bring the table up because it will crash uh, the table will crash into the gantry system and lift it off and then you get to call this gentleman to come out and uh, help troubleshoot on fixing things.
Um, but if you look at it and it says six inches, then by all means set it to one, and then that way it will raise up and it will at least be out of focus, but it'll allow you to fine tune it with using the controls to bring it into focus wherever you need to. Um, to go ahead and calibrate. If for some reason uh, it's down five inches and it thinks it's at zero, it's not gonna let you raise it up past 50 thousandths. In order to unlock the sensors, you be, first of all, hit Home Z, manually bring it up and see if it, if it stops still mid-range. Uh, mid if you hit Calibrate, as soon as you see this screen up, it won't allow you to input any type of number value, but it will fully unlock the, the Z-axis to allow you to raise up past that 50 thousandths point. And then all you have to do is hit save, and it will say, do you want to do this? Hit yes, and then it will re-zero your focal length to the engraving table. Um, there, there, is, there is a difference between a cutting table and the engraving table. The engraving table is the flat aluminum. The cutting table is the honeycomb uh, box. So when you're calibrating, if you, if you have the erroneous picture height and you have to recalibrate the, the lens, you need to, again, pull the cutting table out, and you're going to be using this calibrate feature under lens size. As soon as that's calibrated, hit Home Z one more time, and then put the cutting table in. Make sure that it's set. Keep, uh, have the Z feature here so you can see it go from 12 to 6, and you know it's reading the cutting table, and then bring that up to a zero focus, and use the, the focus tool to see if, uh, by the way, this is your focus tool. Make sure that's in the camera. <laughs> um, this is your focus tool. This is what you're going to be using to make sure that your the, the, the your substrate is within focal distance, um, and also for calibration. What you're going to be doing is there's a flat surface to a 45. So that 90 to 45, that's your focal point right here to the base to the bottom of this. The base plate of the carriage. You're going to match. You're going to match that portion up to the to the base plate. Um, and that will be at the bottom of that base plate. That's your focal point. Um, when, when you go into recalibrate, say you, you bring the, the cutting table up to zero focus um, and you need to recalibrate it, if you uh, go ahead and this is grayed out, but with the cutting table in will be illuminated, you basically open that up and then it will allow you to bring that cutting table up to the focal range and then allow you to calibrate. If you have the cutting table in and say as a student, you tell them you just have to recalibrate the table. Well, they weren't here for our training uh, lesson and they're coming over here over to lens size and they're trying to recalibrate it. It's gonna give them an error. So if the cutting table is in, you cannot, you cannot override your main table calibration using this guy here. It will tell you you're trying to calibrate the engraving table, you have the cutting table in. Um, and vice versa, is for some reason it's registering that the, the cutting table's in and then you go, um, uh, and you are trying to, to calibrate the engraving table, it will tell you that you need to use the cutting table as well. Or, um, or if for some reason this is highlighted, the cutting table's not in there, and you click that, it will say uh, you need to uh, go to the engraving table. Uh, rotary, you shouldn't really have to recalibrate a rotary, uh, but in that case, there is a calibration feature there. Uh, autofocus. On the left side of the carriage, there's this little like white circle up underneath. It's a sonic sensor, so if you have a certain material in there, you could just hold down the Z icon and it will autofocus the, the table. Um, If you, if you have something in there and it's under the sensor or you could modify the actual location, uh, the, where it says manual focus here, this is where you would modify the location for that auto focusing. Um, so say you're, um, where, where your pieces are gonna be are gonna be the five and five, you just need to put in five and five and when you pull down this auto Z, it will automatically move the carriage to that five and five location, drop the table, and then bring it up to where it thinks it needs to be focused. If for some reason it's out by like an inch, 
then obviously it needs to be recalibrated. Uh, that's when you'll go into the calibrate feature to recalibrate that as well. Um, camera, you don't have that feature, so there's really nothing there to calibrate. I'm surprised that's not grayed out. Uh, application, we spoke of this earlier. Uh, mine are grayed out because I actually have both features activated. So when you guys get your computer and you guys do have direct import, that will be something that will be activated at that time. Uh, again, if for some reason you're dealing with materials that you find that a material that is, that is in the high value subscription, you can always activate that for a 30 day trial just so you can check it out and get that material setting. Uh, and again, I do believe that it, it will unlock it, but I don't think it will take it away. It just won't update because you don't have a subscription. Um, awesome, let's close that on it. Notice here the fan stop right there. If, if the UCP is not uh, fully open, meaning it could be minimized down here, but if it's not open, um, this screen will be on and it'll say ILS 1215. If that is, that means it's not communicating with the laser or with the computer. Either the USB shut off, um, the screen saver's on, but uh, JJ will actually, when he comes in to set up your computer, he'll disable any type of uh, 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 sleep modes, hibernations, those sort of things. Uh, that's actually a bad thing when it comes to these systems because they constantly need to be communicating with the computer. Um, there's multiple types of computers. If you have a base unit and an auxiliary monitor, you could go ahead and have your screen saver on as long as the USB isn't plugged into that monitor. If you get an all-in-one unit where it's a monitor and everything is, is uh, all integrated into one, you're gonna have to shut that screen saver off. Because what'll happen is when that goes out, there's certain hard wires where it will shut off your USBs, and guess what, it disconnects you just spent two hours engraving a job, and now you're going to have to start all over again. Uh, pulse calibration. Uh, this has top and bottom laser. You only have top laser, so that will be the only feature that you will be adjusting to. This is for cutting purposes only. So say you're cutting a square with rounded corners. The material that you're, you're using, when it goes to cut, you find that you can either cut the, the straight lines okay, or you can cut the rounded corners okay, but you can't do both. What you would do is adjust your power settings to cut those straight lines. And then from there, depending if it's cutting too hot, so it's scorching the material, or it's cutting too low and it's not cutting all the way through the material, you will adjust that pulse calibration figure to a positive or negative number depending on what you need to do. And what that will do is it will compensate and spread out the, the pulsing when it comes through that, that corner or the, the, the rounded corner. So say it's cutting too hot, it will then reduce those nodes down and allow it to go with a smoother cut uh, at a softer power, even though it's still firing at the same power. Does that make sense? Um, you're going to be going through a lot of different things uh, before you even get to that point anyways. Uh, the first thing you start off with is speed and power. The second thing you go to is PPI uh, and, and or throughput. Um, as soon as you've exhausted all of those, uh, those different settings and you just can't get it, that's when you'll go to your pulse calibration. Because uh, there's nothing worse than adjusting something and then the next student comes in and it's all out of whack. And I would recommend not discussing pulse calibration with. Uh, um, I'm not sure if, if there is a selection in the advanced driver to reduce those those calibration settings. Um, I think it's either all or nothing. Diagnostics tab. You call up because you're having an issue. Um, 
JJ is unavailable, uh, no one at IST is available, they say, hey, listen, unfortunately I'm in the middle of installing at another school, or I'm unavailable, can you go ahead and call Universal? One of the things we're going to ask you is what is the serial number of the system? The serial no the number of the system is located in three locations. It's located on the inside of this front door, right here, and it's located on the back of the machine on a on a uh, three by four uh, inch plate. Uh, the, the serial number starts off with ILS uh, 1275. Um, we want that whole number. So if we say, hey, what's the serial number? Don't go past the X's and then start off with the, number, the, the, the numbers afterwards. We need that whole thing. Um, it is, uh, it's also located up here on the driver. It is only located on here when the machine is powered on and communicating with the UCP. If the machine is powered off or it isn't communicating, you will not see that there. Can you show that again on the door? Oh, yes. I miss you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a UCP is acting a little funny. Uh, a lot of times, or or say you haven't updated it in say two years, and you call up and you say, well, you know what? There has been a change to a material, or there's a different something setting that has changed that will benefit you. Updating the UCP. There's actually a button here. My computer isn't hooked up to the internet. It is not going to populate anything in there, but. You have our current driver will appear in the top bar. There's a beta version driver that's in the middle bar and previous versions on a fly down in that lower bar. So say you do update to the most current version and you didn't sit and you don't have the version that you had before. So for some reason, uh, something isn't working correctly or it changed something in the software that you didn't like and you want to roll back to that old version, you can always find it through the previous version fly down just load it to your, your desktop and then go from there. Um, when it comes to uninstalling or installing a driver, you have to have admin privileges. So either you either have admin privileges or you've got to contact the IT, IT department and, and so on and so forth. Just know that you will need that. If you do not have that privilege, you're going to end up with a corrupt driver and you're going to have problems. Um, beta version. Beta versions are, are, are put in there for certain specific reasons. If we don't email you a beta version or we don't uh, tell you to use this beta version, do not use that beta version. Don't know why they have it there. I guess it's just in case we're like, oh, this beta version, go ahead and try that. I'd rather email it to you so that way I have control over it. So that is something that I think they should take out. But just make sure that that uh, you don't use a beta version. And you'll know it's a beta because it will be whatever underscore beta. So if you see that up on the UCP, because a student figured they talked to one of us and they selected the wrong thing, then, then just go ahead and revert back to uh, whatever driver you want. Under this category here for laser, it will tell you the wattage of the laser making sure that the laser is fine. If um, uh, we find ourselves in the factory that uh, there's been an update to a laser source, uh, and it, we've plugged in a certain firmware of the laser, you do a laser exchange, and for some reason that new laser doesn't work, and we know that there's a problem with that firmware, we just have to find out about it after we sent you a laser. We may ask you for a firmware, and that version, that V, I think it's 37 right now, that's the firmware of the actual laser source, not the laser system. Um, if the laser is bad, you would know by two things. We'll ask you to look into the rear of the machine. There's a red LED light on the, on the back side of the laser. That should be lit up. If all the doors are closed and you can see that there's no break in the interlocks, that, that light should be on. If you left the door open for some time, that light will fade away and then re-illuminate when you close everything up. Um, but if you find that there's a red X or that laser isn't there at all, there's either an issue with the laser 
or there's an issue with the software. Because every once in a while, if there's a red check or a red X, most of the time it's a laser problem, but if it, if it doesn't show up, some of the time it could be that it's more of a driver issue or some kid got smart and disconnected the laser and then you powered up the machine so it doesn't even see it. Uh, this does come with keys. That's what these are for. So if you want to prevent kids from getting back there and messing with the laser source, lock it up. Just make sure you don't lose the keys. Um, the good news is you lose the keys. Um, we actually have, those keys are master key, meaning you go to the other school because you lost those keys and there's two of them that are kind of connected or up on a key ring, you steal one of them. That way they still have a key, it's still going to work on this system. I do not promote stealing <laughs> whatsoever. I just want to say that. Um, encoders. Uh, encoders are part, uh, basically the, uh, the connection cables between each one of the drives, X, Y, and Z. If there's an issue with an encoder, uh, that could be either a board, like a sensor board, or it could be a driver card that's located in the back of the machine. Um, if those issues arise uh, via you're talking to us or JJ or somebody else at IST, and we say, hey, what does the diagnostic say, and what does this say here, and you say there's a red check mark next to the Y encoder, or the Y encoder doesn't even show up at all, that helps us diagnose some issue that, that's occurring in the system. Um, peripheral devices. Uh, if you have any issues with an X, Y, or Z axis, or some other thing, one thing we'll ask is what does the peripheral devices say? You should have a base of, of certain things that show up here. Um, if one of those aren't there, then that means we're gonna go into a little bit of detail. JJ may need to come out so we can try to figure out what's wrong with the machine. Um, external error. So, uh, you actually, we'll get into it when we crack this bad boy open, but using the air assist, there's a cone, there's a magnet sensor, or a magnet on that cone. There's a sensor on the carriage board, which is the electronic board on the back side of this carriage. If there's a damaged sensor, the magnet falls out, the magnet uh, is demagnetized. Um, and it doesn't read. Uh, if you're running the air and you don't have the cone, that's, that's okay. But if you put the cone in and you're not running the air, that's bad. Because if you run a system and you're cutting, especially with a lot of smoke and everything in, in, that, uh, in the system, uh, when the laser passes through that cone, uh, that smoke and debris gets sucked up in there into a vortex, it goes dense, and then it blows out your focusing optic, which is a chain reaction. It also blows out your number three mirror. Uh, in that case, you're out of about $400 to replace those optics, and guess what, your machine's down until you can replace those optics. So the nice thing is, is with the system, it's smart. So as long as all the sensors and everything are operating as normal, um, this right now, under external air, says low, because we do not have air flowing through. But if we were to turn that air on, it would say high, and that means when we go and hit the play button, it registers that air is flowing through and it will allow you to operate the machine with that cone. If the air is off and it says low, it'll hesitate before it starts and then a warning sign will come up and say you have low air pressure and it won't allow you to run that job until you either turn the air on or take that cone out. Um, that being said, a cone is used for cutting only. Do not try to engrave with the cone. If you engrave with the cone, most likely what's going to happen, because it's so close to the surface material, it will build up a lot of junk on it, and then the laser can't pass through, and then the, and it will start to burn that debris. Smoke may get up in there, or um, th there's adverse effects. You blow out an optic, chain reaction, you blow out the number, number three mirror. Again, you're spending another you know, 400 bucks, 500 bucks on replacing optics. So when you're cutting, that's the only time you want to use a cone. Um, the, 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 the use of the cone is for a couple of things. One, it does keep the optics clean. But number two, depending on the application and the material that you're using it with, it will reduce the flame, but it will also uh, enable for a cleaner cut. So in a sense, it's cooling that edge down to 
where it's not going to allow that laser to heat it up to a certain temperature to cause it to burn. Um, you may find that browning of wood will occur because that, that may burn. Um, the only time that you'll have a negative effect is when you're cutting acrylic. And if it's thicker acrylic, what will happen is, is as the laser comes down to a focal point, it starts off at a, at a certain thickness. So there's an edge curve to all of your cuts. So what's going to happen is, is on the out, so say you cut out a square, each side should fall in. So where the top uh, footprint is going to be smaller than the bottom footprint of that material. Um, that does change per thickness of material. So thicker material, the, 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 the thicker the, or the, the deeper the, the curve is. Um, there are other options. We do have a 3.0 lens, which will give you a higher focal length, a longer focal length. With that longer focal length, that will take your, your edge curve from this and reduce it down to this. Everything comes out at the same thickness. It's just when it comes down to that focal point, you now have a longer, a longer focal area to where it's going to stretch that V down to a, to a narrower edge. So if you're cutting half inch acrylic, half inch acrylic with a two inch lens, you're going to end up with, with a pretty hefty edge curve to it. Um, if you get a longer focal length, it'll, it'll, it'll tighten that up and give you a more vertical edge to it. Um, uh, that being said as well, um, with certain acrylics, especially with thicker acrylics, it's, uh, when it vaporizes it, that edge is hot. So when you get close to uh, a certain point, if, you're, if, you're, um, if your air pressure is high, it may actually frost that edge versus give it a gloss. Uh, if you see, so I, I like to refer to it as coining, but if you look at the edge and you, it looks like pulsing or like the edge of a quarter, then what you need to do is slow it down or increase the PPI to give you a, a more even cut for a glossier edge. You will always find some sort of irregularity along that edge. It's not going to make it 100% glossy and, and crystal clear like a, a routed edge would. So if you were um, cutting acrylic with a router, um, you're going to end up, you actually even with that, you're going to end up with tooling marks unless if you sand it and flame it. Um, with, the, with the laser, you will get a natural flamed edge to it, but you will also see some of that step into it. So uh, there's negative uh, effects to certain applications. Access motors. This says OK. Uh, basically, it plugs in and communicates with the motor. And for some reason, it, um, uh, it'll say error or have a red X next to it. Um, that there's a possibility, well, my X isn't, my X axis isn't, isn't moving. And I go here and it says uh, a no motor or an X next to it. Then my X motor or whatever motor uh, is, is not operating correctly may be bad and would need to be replaced. And most of this stuff here, you really don't even need to worry about. If you're getting to this stage where you're trying to figure stuff out, call us up first so we can help guide you through it because really most of the time, this is more of a diagnostic, I mean, it's a diagnostics tab. So it's used to troubleshoot issues with the machine. And since you guys are all new users, call us first. Either JJ at IST or Universal, let us know so we can help you versus you kind of coming in going, oh, I remember a year ago we talked about it, you know, um, and that, that way that way we kind of know what to do uh, to help out. Uh, there's a little test button here. Uh, what that does is that tests the communication between the computer and the CPU. So it'll go through and kind of do some checks and then tell you that everything's working okay. If you're powered up and you see the ILS 1275 deal there and this says disconnected, um, run this test. See if it is actually communicating. If it is communicating, then great. If not, then obviously we need to do some troubleshooting. Uh, I don't recall if I did actually go over this. Auto Z, I always disable it. There's a little box there, you check it to enable it, and that's where it will automatically adjust the, the table height to that focal length that you uh, denote. So if your material thickness is one inch, you type in one inch, 
it will lower it down one inch and you should have a two inch difference between the, the surface of the material to the actual uh, bottom of the carriage. Um, if you disable that, it will not automatically adjust, but that doesn't, that, that's, not, that's not me telling you, don't input the material thickness when you're dealing with the material settings, because remember that either you automatically adjust the table or it adjusts your power settings. And so I always recommend that you at least input that figure in there uh, when it comes to the material settings, because that way you get the best uh, uh, you know, possible uh, uh, effect. Uh, down here at the bottom, there is a traveling exhaust slash camera and installed with a, with a box. You don't have either one of those, so do not have those checked. Um, that changes motor speeds uh, to compensate for auxiliary uh, different weights that are added to the gantry system. Is there exhaust built into the arm there? Or is that an option? That's an option. No, that's, that, that's an option. Um, with that being said, if for some reason you wanted to uh, do, have trial and exhaust, um, there's two folds. There's uh, a class four, so it allows for a pass-through. You really don't have the option for a pass-through. That's if you have large sheet material that you're going to feed through the sides. There's a module that sets up here with a little key and ignition type thing to where um, you open up the doors, you turn that key on, and it basically bypasses the interlocks on each door. Um, with that being said, if you have if you get class four, you have to have a traveling exhaust. The opposite side of that is, is uh, just real quick, is if you have traveling exhaust, you don't need the class four. I was just putting that out there. Is if you upgrade because these are like Jeeps, you can add to them like a Lego set. Um, and and if you get the class four, you would have to have traveling exhaust. Uh, what it, it, in the back, if you open up the rear door, down on the bottom, you'll see a hole, a, a big like four inch hole, and then, or three inch hole, and then, no it is four, sorry, uh, and then four small screw holes. It's a box that mounts to the back, and on either side here and here, you'll see these like little access panels. Those pop out, and there's a, 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 a shoot, I can never remember, a periscope venting. Basically, it plugs into the bottom, and then on the inside of the machine, there's an out, uh, and then there's an accordion uh, tubing that mounts to a box to the bottom of, of the system. With the exhaust we do have, it's hooked up here. Yes. Is that, <laughs> that pulls from the plugs right back here. So it only pulls the back, so yes. I'm not going to see anything like that. Yeah, there's a box that fits down it's on the right. bottom. And that being said, too, you have the rotary option. Yeah. So with that being said, if you did later add a traveling exhaust, you cannot use the rotary and the traveling exhaust together because of focal length and uh, basically it will crash into the tower of, of the top of the, of the rotary fixture. Does this exhaust go through the it does. Yeah. So there's an open back to the Even honeycomb, the and then in the, yeah, in the back plenum, there's two cutouts. Um, we removed those plates um, so you can put the cutting table in and out. Yeah. If you don't have the cutting table in, you don't necessarily need to re put those plates back in because they're kind of a hassle. What I recommend is you get sheet magnet material because it's thin enough so where you could just apply it and have it below the cutouts, and then you can slide it above and then cover those ports up as needed so you're not you're not worrying about taking screws out and putting these heavy steel plates back um, that being said though we kind of went through the software let's go ahead and crack this bad boy open um, i'm sorry i have to go oh okay. um, this part you already kind of yeah, know about yeah, so yeah, yeah. are you leaving like any lens materials yes uh pretty much in the box okay. you'll end up with your yeah. Your Allen tools, uh, you have lens cleaner in there, lens paper, and a small amount of Q-tips. Okay. And did you show us how to put the rotary attachment on? Uh, no, I was actually just getting to that okay. right now. Is anyone staying? You can see that. Is everybody leaving? Or? Uh, no, I just have to go. Oh, okay. We've got 27 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Until we at least have to pause. Thank you very much. Get from oh. me. The rest of you, we should all talk and do some cutting. So, 
So the keypad here, we have uh, we have a few features. File, um, we can go through, we can change the colors if we have a certain color sent over. And with that, we can also change the material settings on the fly. Again, I always recommend pausing, changing the settings, and resume. Um, power, speed, and PPI are all adjustable on here. We back up. X, Y, this will allow you to move the carriage. You have a total of eight directions that it will move. Front, back, left, right, and diagonal in all four directions. Just when you do diagonal, you have to hold out, obviously, two arrows for it to go into that location. Um, back up, your C axis. You have, you have three different intervals. You have a tenth, hundredth, and thousandths. Um, I typically go between 100 to 1,000 depending on the, uh, the motion of the system. The reason for that is, is if I go to a tent and I want to lower it, it takes a while to get to that tent. And, and so the thing is, is if I need to drop that table down a lot, this moves very quick. But the thing is, is if I hold that down, it moves at a slow pace to that, that distance, and then after that, it rapidly so again, so yeah, but if I'm going in the tent, so it's going to go to that tent and then it's going to go in rapid fashion. So there's a lot, there's a lot less or slower movement in that case. I'm sorry? Exactly, exactly. Um, One, this is one feature that, that we used to have on older systems is that you could toggle between X, Y, and Z without it returning home. Uh, the problem with this one, uh, with our, our current systems, is you can go X, Y, move the, move the carriage to your location, and this will also follow suit on, on the uh, uh, display, or the, the UCP. So, Earlier when I say we have uh, artwork that you could go ahead and move around or move uh, the carriage around and associate that artwork to that position, the same thing is if you actually move this guy over to a certain location that you want, then you can go ahead and go back over the software and go over to the, the, uh, the placement of your artwork and then select whatever of those nine different nodes that you use and go to pointer and then it will move that artwork to that location. Oh, uh, what I was saying here is X, Y, Z, I move there, and as soon as I go back, if I wanted to go back and go back into X, Y to go to a different position, um, unfortunately, you're going to have to start from scratch and then go over. Um, one way you can cheat is if you're going to be all the way over there, it's just go over to your computer and double click on your focus view anywhere on that screen, and it will move the carriage over there, and then you can fine tune that X, Y with these controls versus holding it down. If for some reason you notice that uh, this display becomes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, and it's because there's that one snarky student that you have that you know is probably messing with the system and you really just want to do something to them, is if you hold down all four buttons, that will bring in the contrast and brightness of your display. So most likely they figured that out and they want to mess with everybody. Just tell, uh, just tell them that this actually tracks fingerprints, and then hopefully, uh, hopefully we won't use that. Unfortunately, there's no real way of locking that out. Uh, another thing too is this tells me right here that uh, interlock, so I lock colon T. It's telling me that the top door is open. So if I was to close this, that T goes away. If I was to open up the right door, an R will appear. Or uh, I think this is back, so a B. Front, F, left, or the left door. Um, for some reason, if there's a shorted interlock or something like that, this could be a help because it will tell you, like, left door interlock or something. Or, again, we got some student that comes in here and uses one of the cables and disconnects it, and all of a sudden you permanently have a right door interlock problem, and that way it will have control issues. 
I, I bring these up semi-joking, but I don't bring. I, I bring it up for a reason because I've heard. I, I hear things. I get calls all the time. Okay. Um, so what we want to do is we want to put in this cutting table. The best way to put the cutting table in is go to our software. Hit Home Z. Yes. tip it to the side and your cutting table is not going to be square. It may read it, but when you put your material in here, you'll have a chance of engraving across the anodized ruler on the right side uh, or possibly something over here. So basically what you want to do is you want to slide this in and if you look here, there's kind of a small gap on that ruler. So we want to slide this over to the right. So to the back and to the right. One thing that will happen is say this foot, uh, we have this set up to work. We really won't do that, but if this gets too far over, it'll get behind that ruler. And you'll go and go, oh, it's all the way to the right. If you look here, there's a huge gap, meaning that this table is crooked. So just make sure that you can kind of come over to the right. And here, the done end game is you push all the way to the back and then over to the right and you're solid. Um, you're starting to go. Correct. Over time, you may find that bringing this in and out, in and out, in and out, that back ruler on the engraving table may get pushed back a little bit. If you notice that that's getting pushed back, you just need to reset those rulers. Uh, go ahead and talk to JJ or us, and we can go ahead and guide you through on realigning those rulers. It's really simple. You basically have it in focus, and you use the driver software to relocate the carriage to certain locations to loosen screws and tighten them down and you're set. Um, the one thing you want to do is that when we lift it, when we lift it up this table, that uh, that seal is like on a telescope. So when you go and grab it and pick it up, you end up squishing it and pushing it in. So what we want to do is, is make sure anytime we put the cutting table in is that we just basically push along the thumb screws on either side to make sure that that uh, vent is, is pushed all the way to the front 
to allow for maximum suction. All right, now that the cutting table is in place, we come over here. Now it's at seven, seven inch, or uh, five inches. So earlier I said six. I just couldn't really remember, but five inches is going to be the max depth that you're going to have with the cutting table. And then from there, since it had registered the, since it had registered the, uh, the cutting table, we could actually just come in here, go to. I'm just going to put in, I'm going to put in one. So from here, if I wanted to make sure that we're in focus, Go to like Home Depot or Lowe's 
and buy a big roll of like brown painters like paper or whatever. It's where you would throw it down on the ground. And what you could do is typically it'll come in like in a two foot roll. So you just bring it out, cut it to uh, to, to size, and then just use masking tape and tape it to the cutting table. And then from there you'll have a box. So say that's a, what, a eight inch square. So what you'll do is you'll cut like a, either a seven and three quarters or an eight inch square out and you'll end up just peeling that, pulling that, that portion out, then you can lay your material right into that open cavity and you'll maximize the draw of the, of the, of the down duct tape. And if you're only dealing with small portions of stuff and say you're on this side of the table or on that side of the table and you want to uh, increase the uh, upper exhaust flow but you still want that draw, you could close either one of these on this side. So not necessarily down below, I and mean, you can always put that magnet material in there, but if you close up at least the top portion, that'll also help control some of your exhaust. Uh, the other thing too is um, you do have two exhaust ports. So obviously one's on the left side, one's on the right side. You can see where they're divided there. Uh, if you're cutting something solely on the left-hand side and you realize that you actually don't need draw of sorts on the, the right-hand side of the table, then just damper down, close down one of those, those uh, blast gates, and then you're, you're maximizing that draw on one side of the table. Do you guys have any questions regarding the cutting table at all? something and I move the carriage. So I move the carriage, I move the arm. So now it's misplaced. All you have to do is go to the UCP and hit home XY and then that'll take it back. So you hit the Y sensor and they'll come across and hit the X sensor and you don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, one thing you, you may want to do if, if you're not dealing with time crunches is there's an option in the, um, on the settings tab to actually home XY before grading or before cutting. So in case you have a lot of students coming through and you don't know exactly who did what to who for how much type thing, is it will automatically, every job as soon as they hit play, it will always go home and rehome itself. Uh, there's also a feature of not returning home. Uh, this works great is if you have some type of like bowl shape where it fits up underneath the gantry system, but the carriage will crash into it. What you could do is move the carriage over into position to where it will be center of the engraving, and then you disable the uh, home XY after engraving, so that way it'll stay in that position. It'll allow you to adjust your bowl height so you'll get a closer tolerance. It'll be able to etch into that bowl. What I would do is probably put it to like uh, auto no margin. So that way it stays confined to the engraving area itself and then you'll it'll allow you to edge it and then you can lower that table down and pull that bowl out or a plate or whatever it is and then um, uh, dis or enable, or I guess in this case disable some of those features that you need uh, uh, disable. Uh, 
know, you're cutting a lot of material. Um, you know, scrap uh, Yeah. We're really, we're really putting it to it. Right. <laughs> right. Um, if you need to empty out the cutting table, that's what these handy dandy trays are for. So to get a lot of debris down there, just go ahead and pull these trays out and then it allows you to clean everything out. Uh, the, the way we, there's venting that's just below the honeycomb and it goes and moves, uh, uh, channels everything towards those drawers. Alright, let's go ahead and just open this up. So you have these two screws here. What those two screws are for is you have two set screws for your mounting bracket. You pull those screws out and the thing is, is with the cutting table, you can't leave these screws in because the cutting table will run into it. That's why you have uh, the, uh, the button head screws on there. But basically what you'll do is you'll, you'll go ahead and use these guys to tie in. And now there is slight adjustments here. What you're gonna do is you're going to actually set the center to, I believe it's like 10 inches. I believe it's 10 inches across. And that's what this hole is for here. Because when we put this in place, technically it will reside in that mount. And then you'll be able to see the 10 mark on that ruler where, where it resides. So that way you know your center point is 10 inches. Um, you notice there's, there's a, a pivot mount because you're going to have these legs that, that tie into either side of that of the, of the actual rotary fixture itself. Um, I mentioned earlier pint glasses. Pint glasses are tapered. When you're etching pint glasses, obviously you're going to be down to a small area. Say you want to etch a whole pint glass, your artwork is working out great for it. Well, that's what the, the deal is for. So you can actually pivot this upward or taper it up. Let me see. Um, these machines are, desi are designed to plug in hot. So if somebody tells you, oh, don't do it hot, uh, I guarantee you, I have talked to engineers, and they said they're designed to do that. Um, if for some reason there is a short someplace where you don't use the rotary fixture, and there's a lot of debris that builds up in the system, and you guys don't clean it or something, there could be a short cause because there was something in there. Uh, I don't know. They, I'm sure you guys probably mill some metal around here. If you get a metal shaving in there, you may cause something to spark. But. Uh, on, on, on any case, normal usage and, and not you know metal debris and other stuff flying around, you should be able to un, uh, disconnect and disconnect uh, this bad boy at work. And again, in the driver, that's what you're going to see is a yellow line that will basically come right across that building. Any questions on the rotary? Two metal plates. Wherever you guys store some of your stuff for, for the system, these are the two metal plates that go back there. Um, again, I recommend that you use magnet material because these guys are kind of a pain in the butt to put in and out um, with those screws. But I, you put the screws back in place, uh, but these are the metal plates for them. And that's, that's when you're not using the cutting table, you want to maximize your exhaust. If you don't put those in there, you're going to minimize your exhaust and you may find them during some application to other conditions. We have one minute left on our table. I'm sorry? We have one minute left on our table. Sweet. <laughs> basic training, you're done. So now it's just application stuff. Cool.